what we want to be talking about is uh, uh, coming to be like Christ. So to be like Christ, this is the telos. This is the end, the goal, uh, the purpose of, of our being believers and our coming to faith in Christ. It is to be like Christ. And so becoming like Christ doesn't happen in an instant. It happens in a process, and, and we move toward it. And, but we're not going to talk about how we move. We've talked about those kind of things before. What we're going to talk about is what it looks like when we find ourselves at this place where we experience the, these uh, uh, in, in 10 different areas where we experience our faith like Christ, like Christ. So today we're going to talk about how we experience our relationship with God as our Father, like Christ. So we think of Jesus as having a unique relationship with the Father, and he did have a unique relationship with the Father, but he invites us, this is the amazing thing about Jesus, he invites us in to that unique relationship he had with the Father, so that in our relationship with the Father, we too can be like Christ in that particular area. So um, this is the way that we want to go. If you look at your insert, um, you can see we're going to move through four different, uh, 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 four different places of growth. So um, I'm, I'm just going to give you what those words are now, and then we're going to talk about them. So when, when we first become a follower of Jesus, uh, we know God, our Father, uh, in the sense of he's the Father creator. And as we grow, we move, and we know God as the Father provider. As we continue to grow, we know God as the Father discipliner. And then finally, uh, as we grow and become like Christ, we get to know uh, Father as our Abba. And so we're going to talk about that, uh, hopefully. And, and so here's the thing. Uh, I know, I know, I know, like we're so pragmatic uh, in things, and we just want, it's like, okay, so then what are the three, hopefully just three steps, I don't want five, but like, what are the three steps to experiencing God as Abba, like Jesus, like Christ, and, and there aren't, that's the thing, there aren't three steps you take, it's, it's, it's growth, it's, it's moving toward it, and, and so all I really hope to do today um, is to give you a vision of what this relationship could look like, what your relationship with God as Father could look like if we, if we experience God as Father like Christ. And, and in giving you that vision, hopefully you will also have that desire, that I want to be like Christ. I'm just telling you, uh, if you have the desire, uh, then you can move that direction. Uh, you can have the steps and never get anywhere. So I'm just trying to, to give you today a, a vision and a desire to be like Christ, to be like Christ in this area of experiencing God as our Abba Father. So we start out, uh, we're, we're going to move forward, uh, through these four uh, uh, stages, I'll say, uh, uh, growth places that we go through. We start out uh, when, we're, when we're a brand new follower of Jesus, when, when we're new to Christ, when we're a new believer, uh, when we're a newborn Christian, like, we're really comfortable with Jesus. Like, gee, I get Jesus. Like, Jesus is, uh, by design, by God's plan, is so much more, like, human than God, right? Because he's God in the flesh. He's God as a human. And so it's easier for us to relate to Jesus. It's easier for us to connect with Jesus. So much so that when we, when we think about God, like, we can get a little shy. We can get a little bashful. Like, like, Jesus is the way to the Father, great, and I just would like to hide behind him if that's okay. You know, like, maybe if I could just get caught up in the robes of Jesus, uh, that, that would be just fine. Like, I know God's the creator, and like, I confess the creed, the Apostles' Creed that we, we say here frequently. I believe, in, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and, and I do, but even that phrase is a little powerful, isn't it? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and say, yes, I do, but I still want to just hide behind Jesus, right? So uh, this past September, Lisa and I took a trip down to, to uh, Tennessee uh, to visit her, her son, Jake, and so Jake has two little ones, Jackson and JC, and so JC's a, a little two-year-old girl, at least she was then, and because uh, now she's three. Um, I hope that's right. Um, <laughs> because sometimes she actually watches. So when we first walk in the door of their house, 
Um, so I'm her grandfather, but even so, when we first walk into the door of her house, she's bashful, she's shy, like she just kind of hides behind her mother and peeks out at me, and she doesn't want to get close to me, you know? Uh, she doesn't want to, yeah, she just wants to hide behind her mom or behind a chair or, or anything, and she was not that way with Lisa. I don't know why, but so she was that way with me. So I, it's the same kind of thing I'm saying. Like, we, we believe in God the Father as our, as our creator, but we just kind of want to hang with Jesus. Well, as we grow, uh, as we progress uh, in, in our Christian life, as we, as we grow in Christ and, 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 and uh, we take these first steps, we become comfortable in coming to God our Father as the Father provider, the Father provider. And, and we do that because this is one of the first lessons we learn from Jesus. So if you read uh, the Sermon on the Mount, first gospel, first big teaching set in the gospel, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and, and over and over and over in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is talking about how the Father uh, uh, thinks of us and how we, and this is like brand new stuff. Uh, so you need to, you need to like appreciate this, that, that um, uh, it, it, uh, as, as Jewish folks listening to Jesus, as people steeped in the Old Testament, this God is Father thing, that's not the way they talked about God. That's not the way they thought of God. Um, and so, like, that we could talk about Jesus and think about Jesus as our Father. Like, this is new stuff uh, coming out of the mouth of Jesus that they're hearing. So one of the things that he says is... Uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 6, right in the beginning, so like maybe you're familiar with um, like the, the whole section about not worrying. Uh, and, maybe, so, and this is like right at the front end of, of all that Jesus would teach. So I just, just want just to read a couple sections of that. So in there he says things like this. Uh, Therefore I tell you, uh, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Like, your heavenly Father provides for, for the creation. He provides for the animals, and, and if he does that... Uh, are you not much more valuable than they? If he provides for them, won't he provide for you? And then a little bit later on, he goes on and he says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Pagans run after these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. So Jesus is clearly trying to, to uh, describe for us that, that we, can, we can experience God the Father as Father provider, as Father provider. So much so that, that he tells us to pray this way. So later on in this same body of teaching, in this same Sermon on the Mount, he says, uh, when you pray, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Provide for us. Father in heaven, provide. So we, we, we like this, right? Like getting to know, experiencing God as Father provider, like we kind of like that. That, that works for us pretty well um, and, and, and it inclines us toward prayer and, and so away we go. Now the problem is many, many, many Christians stop here. To know God as Father provider um, that, that's just, uh, that works for me, literally. Like, it works for me. He's providing for me. But, but as our relationship with God and our growth in Christ develops, we're going to discover that we, we won't go any further. We can't go any further. We cannot mature as Christians. We cannot be perfected without this tricky little word, discipline, discipline. So we just stop short of that. Like, I'm not, really, I'm not really into that part of the whole thing, right? I'm not really into the, to the discipline part. 
Now, I want to say, I'm using this word, and I want to separate it off from another word. I want us to know that we, we, we can experience God as our discipliner. I'm not using the word disciplinarian uh, because of just the exclusive connotation that disciplinarian has as someone who does the punishing. You know, like every once in a while, uh, you'll hear people talk about their parents, and they'll say, well, my mom was a disciplinarian. Well, you know, everybody gets this instant picture of your mom as the one who did all the punishing. Well, so punishment is not excluded from being a discipliner. It's just not the point of it, all right? It's not the point of it. Sometimes when we think of disciplinarian, we think of, of uh, like the angry, par angry parent who uh, is uh, upset with her child and wants to inflict pain. Um, so we're not about inflicting pain for the sake of pain. So discipline produces something in us. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Uh, in any area of your life, in any area of your life, you know that you, you, you cannot become proficient in anything without some measure of discipline. Like maybe we want to use the word instead of discipliner. Maybe we want to use the word trainer. We need a trainer. So here's what we often do. Like we watch people and we admire things that people can do. Like, like maybe some of you are watching the Olympics right now. And so people put weird things on their feet, right? Like skis and skates. Like I don't know why you put those on your feet when shoes are really good. But they put skis and, and skates on their feet and they do amazing things with them. And we watch them and we think, man, uh, that's just, they're great, how do they do that? Maybe we even say, uh, I, I, I wish I could do that. Or, or maybe you watch somebody sing. Or maybe you watch somebody who can, who, who can dance really well. And we say that line, don't we? I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. But, but we, don't wish, we don't wish that we could endure the discipline it took for them to become as they now are. Like, we don't want that. We just want, right? We just want to be able to do it. But for them to do it, they had to endure discipline. They had to have a, a trainer, a discipliner. So this is the way I want to, uh, I don't know why I took those off. This is the way I want to define what a discipliner does. This is the person who makes you do the things you do not want to do so that you can do the things you do want to do but were previously unable isn't that good? I'll read it again for you. You ready? A discipliner is the person who makes you do the things you do not want to do so that you can do the things you do want to do but were previously unable. Isn't that good? Yeah, like things like shooting a bow or or throwing a strike, or running a race, or playing the piano, or passing a test, or performing a dance, or winning the game. All of those things, behind the beauty, or behind the excellence uh, of, of what we're watching, there were hours and hours and hours of people doing that which seemed unrelated, and some of it was excruciating. So like how many of you, uh, how many of you remember like the, the first Karate Kid. Yeah? Yeah, good. Okay, that works. So, uh, like in the first Karate Kid, there's this beautiful example of this, right? You have, you have uh, Daniel who goes to see Mr. Miyagi, and he wants Mr. Miyagi to teach him karate. And he says, all right, I will teach you karate. Here's what you're going to do. First, you're going to wash and wax all the cars, and then you're going to paint the fence, and then you're going to sand the deck, and then you're going to paint the house. And this is how you're going to do it. You're going to put the wax on, and you're going to take the wax off. And you're going to paint the fence like this, and you're going to uh, sand the floor like this, and you're going to paint the house like this. And, and Daniel's like, what's that? Just do it. And so he does these things, and then he shows them that, that all of these movements, wax on, wax off, paint the fence, uh, sand the deck, uh, 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 paint the house, all of these movements are, are putting in him this muscle memory and this, this mental memory of, of the things that he will need to do to be proficient in karate. Now, I know it's just a movie, but that's the point it's making. 
It's like you're doing these hard things so that you can do the thing you actually want to do. And so God is a discipliner in that sense. He wants to conform us, to transform us into the image of Christ, and he doesn't do it by magic. He does it by, by having us work through things that are just hard. And some of it is like punishment, but, but most of it isn't. We, we read these words uh, in the letter to the Hebrews where, where uh, Paul says, uh, no, not Paul, uh, whoever the writer is, but not Paul, uh, says, um, uh, my child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord or lose heart when you're punished by him, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. Like, people he doesn't love, who cares? But the Lord disciplines those he loves and he chastises every child whom he accepts. And so then the writer goes on, he's quoting there, but then he goes on and he tells us, endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as children. This is, this is your father discipliner. He's treating you as children. We had human parents to discipline us. I'm still quoting the Hebrews. And we respected them for it, maybe. Should we not even be more willing to be subject to the Father of spirits and live. For our parents disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But Father, God, disciplines us for our good in order that we may share his holiness. Like there's a purpose toward this discipline that we're going through. Now discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant, right? It, if it was pleasant, it wouldn't be discipline, right? It would just be fun. But it's not fun. It's discipline. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. It yields. Those are really important words. Discipline has a yield to it. And when we come to know God as the father discipliner, we find ourselves then able to move into this, this, this fourth area, this, this fourth stage of our becoming like Christ, where we, where we get to know Christ, or sorry, where we get to know God our Father as the Abba Father. Abba, A-B-B-A. -B -B this word, Abba. It's the earliest vocalization of a Jewish child. Much like the first vocalization of our children might be the syllables ma ma, mama, or papa. The earliest vocalization of a Jewish child is Abba, Abba as his father holds him. It's not, it's not a, an address of, of some, it's not like just this casual familiarity, you know, like it's not, it's not like, it's not like walking into your father's house and putting your feet up on his couch and saying, how's it going, pops? Okay, it's not, it's not like that. But it's more... So I, 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 I want to use the word tender. That, that's the word I want to use. Abba is a tender word. It's more like walking into your father's house and sitting down at the kitchen table with him because your heart is troubled. And you say, Pops, I, I, I need your help with something. See, you can use the same word and just in a different way. Not casual, familiar. It's, it's tender. It's tender and, 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 and respectful. Jesus shows us. Um, so, you know, like, Jesus came to show us the Father, right? Like, we read this in John 1. He came to show us the Father. He came with this understanding that if, if you could see the Father the way I see the Father. 
If you could know the Father the way I know the Father, if you could experience Father as Abba the way I experience Father as Abba, you, you, you would be so on board with everything, with everything that I'm showing you and teaching you. Like, like this starts out when, when he's just a boy. Like he's 12 years old. And, and his family goes up to Jerusalem from Nazareth and, 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 and Jesus somehow separates him from the traveling party and, and when they go looking for him, he's in the temple and like they're like, what are you doing here? And like, I didn't you know? I, I, wouldn't you expect to find me in my Abba's house? In my Abba's house. When he's 30 years old, He's baptized by his cousin, John, John the Baptist. And, 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 and when he comes up out of the water from the baptism, the, the sky opens up and, and something, well, the Holy Spirit uh, descends upon him, something like a dove. But he hears these words. He hears the words of his Abba. He hears the words of the Father saying, this is my son. This is my son whom I love. I am so pleased with him. Listen to him. I, you know, there are countless children that have never heard that kind of affirmation from their father. This is my beloved daughter. This is my beloved son. I am so pleased with them. But Jesus hears it. It's a tender moment. It's an Abba moment. In John's gospel, Jesus continuously talks about his relationship with his Abba, with his Father. Uh, in, in John uh, 5 and 6, especially, like 25 times, 25 times in those two chapters, he talks about his Father and his relationship with his Father. And he says things like, like uh, oh, whatever I see, whatever I see my Abba doing, that's what I do. Whatever I hear my Abba saying, that, that's what I say. Uh, uh, in John 16, he's talking to his disciples in the upper room. This is his last time with him before Good Friday, before the crucifixion. And, and he says, uh, the hour is coming, it's already here. Uh, when you're going to scatter, each one of you, you're going to desert me. Each one of you is going to go to your own home and you're going to leave me alone. Yet, yet, but I won't be alone. I won't be alone. Because my Abba is with me. My Father is with me. Jesus was known to, to spend long hours early in the morning and, and late at night talking with his Father. And it culminates his conversations with his Father have this amazing culmination point um, uh, in the garden and on the cross. So um, this, this, is a, this, is a, this is a section of Jesus' life that, that we refer to as the passion, all right? This is called the passion. From the time Jesus takes his disciples up to pray uh, um, uh, in the garden of Gethsemane on, on the Mount of Olives, in that moment, uh, to the moment of his death on the cross, that Thursday and that Friday. That's called the passion and, 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 or, the, or the suffering. This is the time of Jesus' suffering. And, and in, you, you might notice, like in most of the Gospels, like huge chunk of the Gospels is just taken up with the passion. But here's what's interesting about, about, about uh, uh, the way the story goes. Uh, it's bracketed, the story is bracketed by Jesus' prayer to the Father. So he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and he's, he's praying, he's struggling, he's wrestling in prayer and, and, and we have the prayer uh, of Jesus saying, Abba, Father, if you're willing, if it's possible, like let this cup pass over me. Don't make me take this cup of suffering. That's what Jesus is praying. And, 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 and he's just like, you know, he's on his face before his father. But it's the one place we see 
the word recorded that way, Abba. Abba. If it's possible, let this cup pass over me. And thus begins the passion. And then it ends on the cross where his last words are, Father, Abba, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last and died. Now you know what I, you know what I want you to, to get from this in part. Jesus cannot do this without this Abba Father relationship he has. He, can, he cannot do it without it. So we, we like to, it's it's popular for us to say, and, and, and I don't I don't want to disparage this at all. It's popular for us to say that that what that what drove Jesus to the cross and what kept him on the cross was his love for us. We like to say that. We actually sing that. Um, and, and Jesus loves you. This I know. Uh, but I want you to understand what the text actually says. It doesn't say that Jesus' love drove him to the cross and kept him there. It says God's love sent Jesus to the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. And God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, the, the God we like to hide from loves you so much that he was willing to put forward his beloved son, the son that he enjoyed the fellowship with from all eternity past. He was willing to put him forward as the sacrifice for our lives. It was God's love and, and what, what kept Jesus on the cross, what got him to the cross, was his trust in the Father. Abba, Father, if you're willing, let this cup pass over me, but not my will, yours be done. See, that's a prayer of trust. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I know you're taking me home. I trust. That's the relationship. Jesus was able to endure the cross because of his Intimate trust with his Abba. So I want you to, uh, I want to ask, um, I said that, that Abba is a, is, a, is a word of tenderness. And so I wonder for us, like, do, you, do you have memory of a tender moment? that you've experienced with your father or, or a tender moment that you've experienced uh, as a father? Like you, do, do you have an Abba moment, an Abba experience with your father as a father? And, and, and what was that like? Uh, so I want to share two, with a father and as a father. Or with, not with a father, but with actually my father and as a father. So the parable of the prodigal son, one of the two most familiar parables right along with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, it's such a well-loved parable that we, we often get, find ourselves uh, talking about it as, as if it was a true story. Well, because it is, isn't it? Like, like this is what happens. When the parable of the prodigal son, uh, uh, the son leaves the estate uh, to go experience the world and all that the world has to offer. And, and, and he, he scorns his father and, and all that the father has and he goes off and 
and while he's out in the world, uh, he, he uh, realizes what he's left. And, and he decides, like, I, I need to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back to the Father. And so he makes his way back. And the way the story goes is, it says that while he was still a long way off, the Father saw him. A, a, a long way off. So he's been watching, right? He's been, like, every morning, he goes out his front door. This is how it sounds like it's a real story. Every morning, he comes out his front door. It's like, just looking down the road to see. And one morning, he comes out the front door, and, and he looks down the road to see, and there he is. He recognizes how we, we could hardly know. But he recognizes his son. And so the story goes that, that he pulls up his robes, and, and, and he runs toward his son. He runs toward his son. And, and it says his heart is filled with compassion, filled overflowing with compassion when he sees his son. Like, can you feel that? And when he gets to his son, when he reaches his son, uh, it, it actually says he, he threw his arms around his neck. So he embraces him. He, he throws his arm around his neck and he kisses him. Might, might be better to, to read it as, as he was continually kissing him. Because that's the way it would be, right? It wouldn't just be this respectful uh, kiss of a greeting. It's like, because his heart was overflowing with compassion. How does that kiss go? I think it goes something more like this. Like, don't you think? Like, I didn't know how else to illustrate that. But I think it's a kiss that never stops. Like, he just keeps kissing him while he's embracing him around his neck. Because his son who was lost has now returned and come home. All right. A kiss and an embrace. That's, that's the Abba experience. A kiss and an embrace. So here's my, here's my two father stories. About 13 years ago, uh, my dad was celebrating his 90th birthday. Uh, he's deceased now. Uh, on Thursday, uh, he would have been 103. On his 90th birthday, uh, we thought, it was kind of like, you know what, dad's getting kind of old here now. Uh, we probably should do something big for his 90th birthday. And uh, so we all go to Florida, because who doesn't want to go to Florida in February, right? Uh, so we all go to Florida, uh, all meaning my siblings and our spouses. And we, we're going to celebrate uh, my dad's 90th birthday while we're there. And so uh, in preparation for this, I was thinking about, because um, I, I, actually for a long time I had thought about, like, what would you say about your dad at his funeral? So, like, in, because, like, <laughs> that sounds kind of morbid to you, doesn't it? But, like, so, I'm not just a son, I'm a pastor, so I'm always thinking, like, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? And, and, and so, I'm always running, I was running these things through my mind, like, what would I say at my dad's funeral about my dad? And, and, and it finally dawns on me, like, dad should probably hear this. Like, dad should probably know what I'm going to, like, wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't if it's good stuff, you want to hear it. And so uh, I typed it all up, and, and I printed it out, and, and I put it in a birthday card. And, and, and this actually, it, it is what I read at my dad's funeral. It, it was his eulogy. I, I just let him see it ahead of time. So I'm not sure why it worked out this way. Um, but I didn't, give, I didn't give my dad his card until it was time for bed. And um, so my sister and her husband and, and Lisa and I, uh, because all the siblings were there, and we got there last, so we didn't get the bedrooms. Uh, so we have to sleep out in the living room. And so we weren't ready for bed yet. It was kind of early, and, and uh, dad was going to bed, and we were staying up a little bit longer. So we were just sitting up in the living room, and, and I'd given Dad his card, and, and he took it into his room, and, uh, and he read the card, and, and, and he read the letter. And um, he comes into the living room, 
and he's tearful, and he, he bends down, and, and he kisses me on the cheek. However many times I've washed my face in 13 years, I, I, I have never washed that kiss off. I don't know if I don't know if you've ever been kissed by your adult father. Uh, maybe it's common. But it wasn't common for me. Uh, that, was a, that was a tender moment to receive the kiss of my father on my cheek. So I keep that. That's the kiss. Here's the embrace. When I was pastoring in uh, Pleasantville, uh, we took a mission trip to a Navajo reservation in New Mexico. Uh, it was called Four Corners, and uh, it was near Shiprock, New Mexico. Now, Shiprock is actually a rock formation that, guess what it looks like? Yeah. So it's a rock formation in New Mexico that, that looks like a ship. And uh, so that's where we were going, and we were staying in a church. And we went as family groups. Like, it wasn't a, a youth collection. It wasn't a man collection. It was family. So these, our, our family, we all went as a family. And, and uh, so I took all three of my girls. Uh, Rachel was, like, one or two. Um, Bethany was nine years old. Now, uh, as adorable as Bethany is, uh, as a nine-year-old, uh, most people experienced her as less than adorable. Um, the, another family that went with us had uh, a young girl that was about Bethany's age, and most people experienced her as adorable. Because this is just the way it is with kids, right? Like when they're nine, some are more adorable and some are, are less so to other people. Well, I'm not exactly sure what happened. Like I could have Bethany tell you maybe, but I don't remember what happened. But somehow or another, uh, Bethany did something that got her into trouble. And uh, it had something to do with, with the other uh, little girl that was on the trip. And uh, so I, I'm going to tell you how everybody reacted, but not to disparage them, ju just to show you the difference between, like, everybody else and, and a father. So um, uh, on that particular day, uh, Bethany's mother acted as the disciplinarian, and punished her by not allowing her to go to see the shiprock. So everybody else was going, uh, but Bethany had to stay behind with somebody. Me? I don't, we didn't leave a nine-year-old there alone. But she wasn't allowed to go. And when everybody came back, uh, Bethany was told she had to go and apologize to this other girl. Well, uh, whether I imagined it or not, I felt like that my daughter was the object of scorn from everybody else in that group. Like all of the families seemed to, again, in my mind, focus their scorn on her. And she went, we were staying in the church building, and she went to the room where the other girl was staying, and, and she knocked on the door, and uh, nobody opened the door. Maybe nobody was behind the door, but nobody answered the door. And Bethany uh, slumped down in the hallway and began to cry. As her father... I could not endure the scorn that I felt like was on her. And so I, 
I scooped her up in my arms, and I took her away from that. I took her away from the scorn. I took her away from the place of hurt. And out in the back parking lot, there was a, a Navajo building called a Hogan. Now, a Hogan is just its a circular building that serves as a shelter. It can be a home. It could be a chapel. This was a chapel. But the shelter is the key word because I took Bethany into that shelter and I just, I held her in my arms while she cried. I want to say that in that moment, how I felt as a father, I thought, oh, this is how God feels. This is exactly how God feels. Like he wants to pick his children up and remove them from the place of pain and from the place of scorn. And he wants to carry them into the place of shelter. That's the Abba that we have. Okay, one more story. Uh, Brennan Manning was a, um, uh, a Catholic priest and uh, he spoke a lot about the way in which God loves us. And if you want to go, you can go uh, Google Brennan Manning Abba, and, and you'll, find, you'll find a video where he's speaking to a group of people. And he tells this story. He tells a story about uh, a woman named Yolanda. Yolanda was a, a 37-year-old woman who lived in a leper colony in Louisiana. Like, yes, uh, there is a leper colony in the United States, and it's in Louisiana. And Yolanda, uh, she'd had leprosy for five years. It had transformed her from a stunningly beautiful young woman to a person who, well, a person from whom you would turn your face away. A person that, that some might say looked grotesque. Her husband divorced her. Her husband uh, forbid her teenage sons from visiting her. And so Yolanda is abandoned. And uh, Brennan Manning goes to visit this leper colony and and he has a healing service, and, and Yolanda asks if Brennan Manning can come into her room and anoint her with oil. And so uh, he does. He comes into her room. Um, it's, it's, it's a dark day. It's an overcast day. It's a gray day. The room is, is very subdued, light-wise. And he anoints her with oil, and he prays for her. And, and after he anoints her and prays for her, uh, he looks away, but he notices the room has lightened up. Like, the room is bright. And he assumes that the sun has come out. And he looks out the window to discover, no, it, it is still dark and gray outside. And then he looks at Yolanda's face. And, and her face is lighting up the room. Not figuratively. Her face is lighting up the room. As there's, there's a beams of light that emanate from her face. And so Brennan Manning asks her, like, Yolanda, what, what is happening to you? And she said, The Abba of Jesus just told me he's taking me home today. The Abba of Jesus just told me he's taking me home today. And Brennan asks her, Yolanda, what, what did the Abba of Jesus say to you? He said, Come now, my love, my lovely one, come. For you, the winter has passed, the snow over and gone. The flower appears in the land, the season of joyful song has come. 
The cooing of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Come now, my love. My lovely one, come. Let me see your voice. Oh, sorry. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face beautiful. Come now, my love. My lovely one, come. Now, you might not recognize it, but those are the words of Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, chapter 2. But the thing is, Yolanda was illiterate. She never read the Bible. Her Ava said to her, Come now, my love. My lovely one, come. Six hours later, she died. She was carried away in the arms of her Abba. And he was kissing her face. Would you like a relationship with God like that? Would you like to know your heavenly father as father creator, father provider, father discipliner, but more than that, as your Abba father? That is just like Jesus. Jesus.